Doing well. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Great. Great. I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, our lucky day. Uh, I watched it this weekend. And um, obviously, because I was interviewing, I really paid attention to the soundtrack. And uh, I often do uh, because music in scores in film or something that I really pay attention to. So um, I really enjoyed your your soundtrack uh, in this movie. And congratulations on a really well done soundtrack. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about yourself and the film. So um, I, I read I read some other interviews with your with with yourself and uh, you started off as a musician. And what made you get into uh, becoming a composer? Well, first off, thank you so much for the kind words. I'm really glad that you enjoyed the, the film and the score. Um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting path for me. Um, a little, maybe a little unorthodox. I started, uh, you know, as early as I can remember, I loved music and I was handed a guitar when I was five years old and I could just kind of play, you know. Uh, I did take some lessons and things as a kid, but I was mostly self-taught. And, you know, by the time I hit my teens, the Seattle music scene was um, really underway uh, and, and exploding uh, with bands like Nirvana and Soundgarden. And I lived just a couple hours outside of Seattle. So my eyes were uh, set on that and moving there. And, and I wanted to be, you know, in a band playing guitar and, and living the rock star lifestyle, you know. And um, but of course, you know, that's not always the best plan to, to spring on your parents. So um, I did alongside that when I moved to Seattle, I, I went to um, study audio engineering and mixing. And so I actually was playing in bands and then I got my first job kind of in the business uh, working at an audio post house when I was 19. And it was kind of during this time, you know, I'd always enjoyed um, film scores as well, but I had never even considered doing that. You know, it seemed just like something that somebody else would do. You know, I was I was so entrenched in kind of the rock world and guitar. I wasn't thinking about how to write for an orchestra or even know where to begin with something like that. But um, I was always really into, of course, you know, John Williams and, um, you know, James Horner and uh, a lot of a lot of different composers really inspired me. And um, I was watching a film, you know, well, I guess first I, sh I should say I met my wife and got married and I kind of felt like I don't know if I want to try to be like a touring musician and be married and I, I think I was I realized I didn't really want to be have that kind of life after all of, of living on the road and so um, I was at a bit of a crossroads with my musical career and my wife and I were watching a movie one night and she uh, I, I was commenting on how great the music was and and she said uh, have you ever thought about scoring films and it was just this weird like everything kind of clicked in my mind I just thought wow that's a fascinating idea I uh, bought every book I could find on the subject, uh, and um, I just kind of jumped in head first. I ended up studying under a man named um, Hummy Man in Seattle, who has the Pacific Northwest Film Scoring Program, which was pretty new at that point. And that really got me going. I just kind of never looked back at that at that point. How did you start off with the idea and knowing that this is something that you wanted to pursue? Um, did you reach out um, to you know, production companies uh, work on like you work on a lot of short films. So how did that initial uh, start process begin? Well, initially, I mean, like I said, when I first started, I, I couldn't even say call myself a composer without, you know, cracking up. You know, I was like, <laughs> you know, who do I think I am? But after time, you know, I started to learn things and I, I felt more confident. And uh, I was already at that point uh, a few years into working at um, this audio post job that I mentioned. And they, uh, we were doing primarily radio and television commercials there. And so I was also seeing, oh, there's all these other avenues for music. There's, you know, commercials all need music. And, uh, and I had a lot of relationships at that point with agencies in Seattle and even beyond Seattle. And so I just started uh, kind of letting people know, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm writing, you know, custom music on the side. If you ever need uh, a piece of music for your, your commercial, let me know. I'd love to work with you. And uh, and they did, you know, they just started giving me opportunities. And uh, and so that was really great, you know, and the first few things were really, really small, really low budget, not very high risk, you know, but I did have um, some opportunities come along that ended up um, really um, kind of putting more of a spotlight on me. And, and all of a sudden people are, you know, around town kind of realize, wow, Matt's really doing this and he does a great job. And so then it really just blossomed pretty quickly from doing just a few things here and there to 
increasing like you know national um you know big campaigns you know things like that and and so it really did start off in the commercial world for me professionally of course along those lines i was also doing whatever i could uh in in the film world uh and so there, you know i had friends who were producing short films dan brown being one of them uh one of the very first actually and uh and so you know i would i would score their films and it just kind of happened organically in that way um and uh you know as as you know things progressed I realized, you know, that what I was looking for creatively was a little bit bigger than what I was really able to find most times in Seattle. I, I realized if I stay here, I'm going to probably be doing just, you know, a lot of commercial work. And that was the impetus to, to ultimately move to LA and kind of jump into the bigger, the bigger pool, you know, um, with all the big kids. And, um, and that was a, a major shift. And that was also when I started to really transition more seriously into film and, and television work and game work as well. Oh, wonderful. You mentioned you were you worked with Dan um, a few times. Uh, were you involved with the short film from this film? I sure was. Yeah, I scored the short version of Your Lucky Day, which was just a few minutes of music. Um, but, you know, it was amazing because it just, you know, we did it. It happened very quickly. I, I don't remember exactly how long I worked on that, but I can't imagine it being much more than a few days. And then, um, yeah, it just exploded. You know, Dan, posted that online and and within you know days and weeks on Vimeo it had millions of views and it really it really exploded so that was exciting and and honestly I have to tell you not exactly a surprise like he uh from the moment I met Dan um you know we were working on a trailer together for a video game he was doing visual effects and I was doing audio you know audio post and uh I he had done his first short film which is I did not work on it was already completed but I remember watching it and thinking, man, this guy is like a genius, you know, and, and uh, he's just a, a, his mind works in this way that I could never understand. And um, and so I at that point in time, I told him, I, I'm, I'm keen on working on anything that you have, uh, you know, that, that I might be a good fit for. So, um, yeah, you know, uh, I always everything he seemed to do always kind of turned to gold, you know, so I, I um, wasn't exactly surprised when that happened. But then, of course, you know that was there's a long gap between that moment and then when he did decide to make the, the feature well the release dates uh was around you know 12 or 13 years between the two yeah. um in terms of when you worked on them probably around the same amount of time um the difference is you know uh the the short film you did uh you know one song a few minutes and you know this one here if i'm correct me if i'm wrong is 19 tracks on, you know, uh, and, and on the soundtrack album, but I, there's more in the film. Yeah, there's so I actually I actually pared things down uh, because, you know, one of the aspects of film scoring is that oftentimes you're taking a, a piece and you're um, it's it's evolving maybe a little bit for a different scene, but it's the same kind of thematic content. And so I, I there was a handful of cues in there that I thought, you know, this is this is more of the same of what we've heard before and some other cues, you know, it's just maybe it's slightly different and changed to match the scene. Uh, and so I, I wanted the listening experience of the soundtrack to be, you know, as tight as possible as well. So, uh, so there's not quite everything there, but yeah, it was, uh, that's the majority of the music from the film is on that track and it's obviously on the soundtrack and it's a lot more than, uh, you know, than what was ever in the short, the short had just a few minutes. Um, it was really just textural kind of setting a tone, a mood, um there wasn't opportunity the way that there isn't a feature to have different thematic ideas and different arcs to the music and um you know it's just a much more complicated and 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 rewarding process um when you get to score an entire feature i've always been curious about the um the scoring process but you're actually the first composer i've ever spoken to so um i'm gonna ask you what is the the actual process like is it is it all imposed with editors or is it before they start editing like what exactly when exactly does the process take place for you you know it can be different in every film sometimes like in this case if i you know when you have a relationship already with the director and um uh, you'll often have to be brought on a little earlier you know um sometimes even at the script phase like i you know i've, I've heard lots of stories where um you know the director gets uh, hands a script off to the composer and then the composer will write a suite of music just based on that. Uh, for me, I prefer to see uh, see visuals before I start writing, only because I love see, reading the script and, and understanding what the story is. But 
you know how it can be the the tone the color the pacing the the delivery of you know the performances uh by the actors can all really influence the overall feeling and i really i i just i really find that i need that visual um you know point to to reflect on um but uh you know the majority of the time we're coming on at the last minute you know we're the very last you know part of the process uh, along with like mixing the film and maybe some ADR and things, but the audio post is really the end. So, you know, it's more common for me to come in and they've already got everything shot, edited. There's some temp score in there and I've got a, you know, and I've only got, you know, several weeks to get the entire thing done. And it's always, you know, a really tight timeline. So this was nice because Dan brought me on board um, right around. He had a, a rough cut, the first rough cut a few weeks after we spoke. So we had a long conversation about the ideas in the film. Of course, I already knew the basic concept having worked on the short, but uh, there was so much more here in this, in the feature length, you know, these ideas that he had of, you know, um, you know, what is the American dream? What does that mean? What, what do people do when they're thrust into an extraordinary circumstance like this one in this film? What are you capable of? Uh, you know, how do you rationalize and justify your actions? You know, because most people, don't consider themselves a, a bad person, but when you're, you know, sometimes our, our ethics might be um, compromisable given the right scenario, you know? And so there's a lot of interesting ideas to play off of here. Uh, and then of course, you know, the most interesting, or one of the very interesting points of this was, uh, you know, at the end of our conversation, and I, I said, Dan, um, you know, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanna make sure is in the, in, reflected in the music? And he said, well, yeah, it takes place on Christmas Eve. So I'd love to have some holiday vibes in there. And, and that, threw me for a loop for a second because we'd talk, been talking about a very dark score. And then I thought, wow, well, this will be an interesting opportunity. And, and it turned out to really make things interesting uh, and, and unique, I think. And so I'm, I'm glad that, um, that Dan, you know, spoke to that. And uh, so, yeah, we got started. As soon as I got the picture, I started writing. The very first scene I scored was the winning ticket scene um, and uh, sent that to Dan. Uh, and in this case, there wasn't a lot of temp music or just maybe a few times we tried some things to see how they would feel. But for the most part, it was kind of a blank canvas. And so we really got to just be creative in the true sense of the word and come up with something that we felt was unique to this. And he liked the, the first passes that I had done. And, uh, and so we, we just uh, kind of, you know, took off from there. I really enjoyed the uh, the aspect of it being a Christmas movie and there being Christmas music. Um, with there being s such a large catalog of Christmas songs, how did you guys narrow down which tracks you guys wanted to use? Well, that was really all Dan. And, and uh, you know, I think, um, you know, the score part of it is, is what I'm providing. And then there's always the, 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 the needle drop or, you know, the songs that you hear. And in this case, we knew there was going to be a healthy dose of Hollywood, uh, Hollywood holiday tunes to reflect that we were, you know, it was holiday season and all of that. And, um, and then, you know, you run into a lot of uh, legal and logistical issues too with that. You know, it's not just as simple as, oh, I like that song, let's put it in. You know, um, if, if it's, you know, a really major artist and a major release and very, very well-known song, it can be, you know, a lot of money, uh, you know, more money than the entire budget of the, of the film just to license that song. Uh, and so, um, you know, the the songs that were in the film did change and evolve over time. There's also the question of public domain, which is interesting, you know, so that just means uh, some songs have been around long enough that you can use them uh, and there's you don't have to pay any sort of you know fee to do that because they, they essentially at that point belong to everybody and uh, it's an interesting aspect of copyright law but there it gets tricky too there's some some pieces of music that are in the public domain in the US but not internationally it okay it's very very complicated so yeah. yeah luckily I didn't have to handle that too much you know Dan had um, people artists that he was familiar with that he um, brought on to create covers of traditional songs. Um, and then, um, you know, there was also, I think, a handful that were pre-existing that he licensed. Um, so, but, you know, the way that that does impact me is I have to kind of work around those tracks and, and you know, make sure that everything dovetails nicely in and out. And if the mixer is helping with that process as well. Um, but, you know, and then there's also in the score, if you listen carefully, every once in a while, I may throw a little kind of Easter egg 
holiday quote of a familiar melody, you know, a little motif. I do that a number of times in the film um, because it's fun. It was just kind of a fun way to like bring some kind of oddness and levity to, like I said, this otherwise pretty dark tale. And it felt like it needed it. There was, um, you know, we ran the risk of running too dark at times. So having those elements helped help that. Were there any unique instruments used during the creation of this? Well, you know, it's a good question because a, a big part of, of this score, especially, is we were blending a lot of elements. And so uh, so there's definitely orchestral strings. You know, there's a full string section. And, and that's most of the film features that as a bed. It's obviously uh, not unique. It's common in movies. Most most films have, um, you know, orchestra to some degree in them, and the strings are the backbone of the orchestra. Um, so, and also with a holiday film, it makes a lot of sense, you know, because you know strings and and things like choir uh, and choral stuff is is a big aspect of holiday. So I do have um, a lot, of, you know, some vocal elements in there as well, both like a full full choir sound and then also a solo vocalist. Um, and uh, and so and one interesting thing that was unique, I think, you know, compared to a lot of other ways you might find and hear vocals in scores or music in general, is I took I uh, had a fantastic vocalist named Matilda Stray, who I've worked with a number of times. She's a great artist. And she um, we recorded a, a bunch of these you know ideas I had and these melodies, melodic ideas. And then I um, sampled those into my computer and my sampler. And then I started to really tweak them out. So I would layer them up, change the pitch, do all the kind of, you know, strange things that you can do with audio these days. There's so many great tools. And it was just a way to kind of impart, I think, a bit of a modern sound. You know, you hear that a lot, especially now in like, you know, hip hop and pop. There's a lot of, you know, where they're changing the pitch of the vocal in a really unusual and dramatic way. They're very high or whatever. And uh, so I thought, well, this is kind of a fun way to kind of modernize this. But I was kind of building my own little chorus of weird, you know, the end result almost felt like, you know, it's like, you know, some sort of like holiday elves or something. You know? <laughs> so I liked that again, that kind of a bit of, of uh, fun, uh, odd, weird fun in this dark scenario that we're in uh, just seemed to work. It, it needed something like that. So so that was an interesting, uh, you know, technique that we used in the score. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank sure, you. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've always been. Um fascinated with uh, music and score in film, but I feel like the general public uh, for the most part don't really appreciate how connected they are to a scene because of the music. Um, do you think we're now with, you know, big name composers uh, like Hans Zimmer and Ludwig, do you think we're more, we're entering like a Renaissance era uh, of people finally appreciate more, appreciating more so you know, I, I think so. I, you know, it's interesting. And even now, even with as popular as film scoring is, and it's more popular than ever. I mean, it, when I even, you know, 25 years ago or whatever, when I started really getting into this, it was a much, much smaller pool of people really doing this professionally than there are now. And there's so much information available now, you know, that's one of the great things about the, the internet. It's like you, anything you're interested in, you can look up and see videos about how people do it. And you know, it's it's pretty cool to be able to be exposed to what this is, because I think it was one of those just kind of unusual art forms and crafts that people didn't even really think about when they go to see a movie. It's like, oh, it's just part of the experience of the movie is that there's music in it. And I fell into that category as a kid. I when I, I remember just thinking, oh, I don't know where this music comes from. It must be some sort of classical music or something, but it's great. And then when I found out, oh, there's people writing this, that was that was its own revelation, you know, uh, and I started buying soundtrack albums. So it's um, I think it is getting a lot more attention and a lot more appreciation. And it also helps that we've got some really big name um, recording artists that are doing this now. You know, you've got guys like um, you know, like Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, you know, doing scores. And so they bring a whole nother attention, you know, level of attention, I think, to what is film scoring. And, uh, and, and I think they make it accessible to a lot of people who would have not been all that interested um, initially. So, yes, I think we are experiencing, um, uh, you know, a bit of a renaissance. And I think it's, it's really, really great. You know, this is a fairly new industry. I think it's about 80 years old that film scoring has even existed. So it's just kind of starting to enter, I think, maybe a little adolescence. And, you know, we're, we're evolving into something new. And, and it's really interesting to see where all of this is going to go, because the, I think, 
the rules the rule bag has been thrown out and everyone's uh, everyone's really trying a lot of really interesting new things right now yeah yeah matt thank you so much for your time uh your lucky day was amazing and your score was fantastic i look forward to seeing more of your work and hearing hearing more of your work uh let's say and um Thank you so much for your time and everyone out there check out your lucky day, which is available now. Yes. Yes. I think uh, it's out in theaters now. And I think tomorrow it's uh, on VOD. So uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that means the stroke of midnight or how that works, but <laughs> yes, very, very soon. And I recommend everyone watch it. It really is a great film.